And look, before someone says, lazy millennials, okay, back in my day, we read books. Just remember, one, you didn't, okay? <laughs> yeah, you were likely the kid that beat up the kids that were reading the books. It's more likely that you waited for the movie to come out. You know, let's be honest. <laughs> And two, authoritarian governments aren't particularly known for their love of books, you know. Book burnings, on the other hand, they love them. Big fans. Yeah. Hell, they love book burning so much, they even burn copies of the movies based on the books. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, you guys might notice that uh, you, you, you hear a little bit of laughter in the background of these, uh, of these videos, of the Forkful of Noodles videos, and that's because these videos were recorded in front of a live virtual audience. That's right. I perform these, these shows over Zoom in front of a virtual audience that uh, laughs and participates through the show and it's a really fun time and if you uh, want to be a part of that show you totally can you can go to my website krishmohanhaha.com and snag tickets for these shows i do them once a month on the last friday of every month at 8 p.m eastern at 5 p.m pacific they're ten dollars but if ten dollars is a little bit too much if you're struggling financially and you still want to come check out this show that's not a problem uh, reach out to me, send me an email, DM me on Twitter, send me a message on Facebook, various different ways you can communicate with me. Let me know that you want to check out the show and, and you've hit some financial hard times, and I will get you a free code for the show so you can come, hang out, enjoy a, 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 a comedy show that addresses issues that you won't hear on corporate mainstream media, uh, and, and, and be around some like-minded, wonderful people. Uh, so again, if you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, you can snag your tickets and join the live virtual comedy shows that happen every single month. Thank you guys so much and enjoy this video. Now on August 5th, 2019, the Indian government took full control of Kashmir by revoking Article 370 and 35A. Yep. After imposing a shutdown and military siege, the BJP government unilaterally decided to remove the special status that was guaranteed to the state of JNK in the Indian constitution and take away its autonomy. No Kashmiri citizen or leader was consulted in this decision. Yeah. Following this, they broke the region into two union territories, the Jammu and Kashmir territory and the Ladakh territory. It was also decided to bifurcate the state of JNK into two union territories. This is something unprecedented in India. Never before has a state's statehood been taken away. A union territory is ruled directly by the central government, making the local needs and people's will often secondary. And the central government in this case is the far-right Hindu-centric Bharatiya Janta Party or the BJP. This is like demoting Pluto from a planet to a moon or a dwarf planet or... <laughs> Or as some nerds might call it, the Gimli planet. <laughs> you know Gimli. <laughs> we took all of its planetary autonomy away, and some were even boycotting Pluto from revolving around our sun. Yeah. They would scream, go orbit Uranus, you asshole. You know? <laughs> but Pluto can't hear them because sound doesn't travel in the vacuum of space. Ah. It's all for naught. With a special status revoked, Kashmir was placed under full military occupation and a communications lockdown. The Indian government cut phone lines, cell service, and all internet to the region. This means there are teenagers in Kashmir that haven't been able to masturbate in months. Mm. <laughs> no Sears catalog. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Look, I get it. That's a crude joke, right? But if we want Americans, <laughs> <laughs> but if we want Americans to pay attention, we have to include some boobs and dicks, <laughs> and also explosions. You know. <laughs> I mean, hell, most Americans didn't care about Africa or even knew that it was a continent till National Geographic started putting topless women in their magazines. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, people are yelling to save Africa. You know. <laughs> well, kind of. There's like one commercial that still airs at 3 a.m. You know, that's it's the best we can do. Now, this communication lockdown and military occupation prevented people from getting proper health care. Kashmiris couldn't even call the Ghostbusters, let alone an ambulance, right? The, the chances of getting to a hospital in the midst of a medical emergency when all the roads are barricaded are slim to none. Hospital visits decreased by 38%. So this occupation is killing more people than it's saving, which is what the Indian government claims they're doing. Mm-hmm. From August 2019 to January 2020, there was no way for the people of Kashmir to let the world know what's happening to them. And since 2020, the Indian government has opened up the internet again, but only at 2G speeds. That's 250, wow. yeah, that's 250 kilobytes per second. At, at those speeds, it'd take days, days to download one nipple or just the tip of a penis on any person. <laughs> In days okay even with 2g <laughs> speeds the indian government has disrupted services for up to a week in various parts of kashmir look if americans lose the internet for more than 38 seconds we're on the phone with comcast cussing out the poor white collar worker who had nothing to do with comcast policies or shitty service and these low speeds and constant disruptions have led to a vast amount of college dropouts and look, before someone says, lazy millennials, okay, back in my day, we read books. Just remember, one, you didn't, okay? <laughs> yeah, you were likely the kid that beat up the kids that were reading the books. <laughs> it's more likely that you waited for the movie to come out. You know, let's be honest. <laughs> And two, authoritarian governments aren't particularly known for their love of books, you know. Book burnings, on the other hand, they love them. Big fans. Yeah. Hell, they love book burning so much, they even burn copies of the movies based on the books. <laughs> Look, the students living under occupation have PTSD, and education becomes secondary yeah. to survival. Since August 5 last year, we've been in a complete blackout. Internet was barred from us, so we couldn't study using it that we usually do. And we had to give our class 11 exams without any facility, without any guidance from our teachers, without any guidance from internet or uh, YouTube or something. And the pass rate that uh, year was pretty low. Students were depressed. And then it just, we just went to the school uh, in February when the internet was reopened. And it was for just a week or two at maximum. We've not uh, gone to tuitions, we've not been to schools or anything. We don't have proper internet facilities to give our online classes. And yet we are expected to give 70% of our 12th class syllabus in the exams. The JK Bose has uh, issued a notice that we have to uh, prepare for just 70% of our syllabus. But to be honest, we haven't even completed 30%. The 12th class is not a class that you can just self-study for. In 11th, we did something. Uh, I did something. But 12th class, to be honest, it's not something that you can self-study. The chapters, they're so uh, difficult, they're so intense that without a proper guidance, you cannot complete them. As the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition and Civil Society, or JKCCS, notes that these digital sieges, see, digital sieges have become commonplace in suppressing rights and preventing dissent. 
It takes away the constitutionally granted civil, economic, sociopolitical rights and any enjoyment the people of Kashmir can take part in. And yes, enjoyment and happiness are a human right. For, 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 for far too long, we've been propagandized to think that any recreation in our lives is a luxury meant for the rich and famous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happiness is meant for all of us. So instead of making no. people guilty, it should be encouraged. Hell, corporations even know the importance of, of, of happiness, right? That's why they allow you to wear jeans once a week instead of your gray <laughs> sadness uniform. <laughs> Jeans Day is that recognition. But look, at this point in our history, it's become very hard to argue that the internet isn't a basic right. We buy food, pay bills, educate ourselves, make medical appointments, and call each other cunts from great distances <laughs> thanks to the internet. There's absolutely no justification for any government to allow a communication lockdown like this. Considering... Most of the world is looking at 5G, fiber optics, new PlayStations, cars that are also mobile hotspots, and weirdly, improvements in fucking doorbell technology. It is absolutely insane and criminal that Kashmir is facing internet speeds that make dial-up look like the Indy 500. And in addition to this ongoing communication lockdown, India has also introduced two new laws that allow the military and the police to act without consequences. One of them being the Public Safety Act. Two years, Jesus. Two years, two years without a trial, is is what they uh, what what they do with the Public Safety Act. Right. And look, not that trials were commonplace in Kashmir, considering 99 percent of all cases have been delayed because of the lack of Internet and the pandemic. The second law is the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act or the UAPA, which has targeted civilians, protesters and even people that post opinions on Facebook. We, we are observing that even the journalist are being booked under the UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Under this uh, legislation, any person can be declared as terrorist. So the FIRs are being filed uh, against journalists, against the uh, people who are active on the Facebook, expressing their opinion, which is a right in any civilized and a democratic system. <laughs> And you know that guy's old because he said the Facebook. So you got to try. <laughs> the, these people that are arrested, in most cases, are never heard from again. Some are put into jail in Kashmir. Others get taken to, to Delhi. And it's damn near impossible for families to visit them in prison due to barricades, both physical and financial, and the fact that that there might not even be an arrest record. Yeah. Both the Public Safety Act and the UAPA are put into place under the guise of protecting people, much like both versions of the Patriot Act. And much like the Patriot Act, all this did was allow the government to open the fascist Pandora's box. Safety is often used as a rationale by a lot of countries to strip away rights, squash protests, turn neighbors against each other, encourage hate, and propel politicians into full supervillainy. Now, groups like the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons have been pushing back in an attempt to get answers about these forced disappearances, which includes children that have disappeared as well. Many people forget that APDP they want us to forget that APDP is a movement that is really serving a political cause. Uh, many times this movement is portrayed as if it is 
a woman's movement. It's a passive movement looking for their sons as if it has no agenda, so to speak. But the fact is that these women might be accidental activists. They might have been in the four walls of their home and then this tragedy occurred and they were forced to be activists. But over the years, what you see is a certain feminist consciousness uh, arising in them, a certain political consciousness arising in them. And they were political to begin with. So in Kashmir, protest is part of our cultural uh, life. It's part of our cultural legacy. It's part of the legacy of uh, you know, political dispute that we have had. And these women are also political, but many times it's kind of, uh, it's it's decontextualized. It's it's put in a vacuum as if they're just protesting for, the, for their sons to get them back. But no, they are protesting within a certain political idiom. But then on the other hand, the state is also very, very vicious. So there's only certain ways that they can protest. So they have adopted this politics of mourning there are stories of the military arresting kids for playing cricket, which is a sport similar to baseball, but, you know, like, more fun. So, I think we can all agree that the Indian military is anti-fun. Now, without help from the international community, these stories of these parents and the disappeared go unheard. And as of now, there are no international communities that are speaking out against India's brutal occupation of the valley. And if you've ever wondered what the meaning of the phrase silence is violence means, Kashmir is a pretty oh. glaring example of that. The government of India has also decided not to prosecute any military personnel or police in the area. So the police get away with theft and violence, while the military is getting away with kidnappings and rape. Now, this is similar to the problems that the military and police in America have as well. But the women in Kashmir don't feel safe from the gaze of the military. This is an account of uh, a female journalist that uh, talked to Ifat Ghazia, the host of uh, the Kashmir podcast. Working in a conflict-prone area like Kashmir is even tougher for females because there is a sense of insecurity that has developed in the minds of everyone in Kashmir. I use public transport for traveling to the office or to go out for stories. The roads are full of military presence. They are gazing at me and I do not feel safe at all. After the abrogation, the presence of military bunkers on roads has doubled and during night hours, they keep patrolling the roads. So my parents are worried when I come home late and they keep calling me until I am home. Because I told you already, there's a sense of insecurity in everybody's mind here. And to triple down on military dictatorship, India has adopted a new media policy which tells journalists what they can and can't say. Uh, the local news newspapers have actually stopped uh, covering stories of these human rights violations perpetrated by the state, which is one of the most important story uh, in Kashmir, which is a war-torn region, and that cases of torture, illegal detention, and coercion finds almost no space in media anymore. And also any story that may be considered against the government, uh, the newspapers now avoid covering uh, or uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, Otherwise, uh, the me local media, which uh, include mostly newspapers, and no, there is no broadcast local media in Kashmir because they don't, they are not permitted here. Uh, so all these newspapers will not cover any of these stories anymore. Uh, the government, wherever it finds that the press has to be muzzled, it does so by sending law enforcement agencies after journalists and after newspaper owners, and many of them have been are being questioned even now, uh, even just uh, weeks back, a week or two back. A uh, senior journalist, Parvez Bukhari, one of our colleagues, mm -hmm. was questioned for an entire day by and by the National Investigation Agency, which is a central invest and law enforcement agency in India, and they questioned uh, Parvez. Uh, uh, in a rela case related to terror funding. And most of these people who were questioned along with Parvez are rights activists, are human rights activists, and other um, mm -hmm. non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. not profit organizations who work <laughs> in the region. Uh, 
And this is also happening at a time when no foreign journalist is actually allowed to travel to Kashmir without permission from the government in Delhi. And it seems like uh, from past year, no one has been permitted because uh, it's been over a year that nobody from the international media or foreign journalist has been able to visit Kashmir or has been able to cover it, uh, especially after August 5. With journalists also being forced to reveal their sources, most people are too scared to speak out. And with no foreign reporters allowed in Kashmir, the world only hears the narrative the far-right Indian government wants them to hear. So the average Westerner gets spoon-fed propaganda. But don't worry, this propaganda is coated with sugar, okay? I don't know if, I don't know if you guys have ever tasted regular propaganda, but it's like super bitter, you know, like... It's like it's like oversteeped tea or or what I assume Winston Churchill tasted like when he made people yeah. kiss him. <laughs> Which now I assume is going to be a nightmare for everybody tonight. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> With just a touch of Winston Churchill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, most of the true reporting is coming from independent journalists who spend most of their time debunking government narratives. So our average day now has just been uh, to scroll around from looking at the government feed, what the government is putting out, uh, the kind of narratives that it is putting out, and uh, trying to see if uh, there is any reality in it. Because there's a lot of hogwash in that sense that the government wants uh, focus to shift away from what the actual problems of the people are, what the legal, what the problems of the illegalities of its own systems are, and it does not want journalism to be looking at these structures and trying to find gaping holes, which is what the job of journalists is. Uh, but uh, so our average day is just looking at this feed, and uh, because uh, we're extremely short of resources on that front and try and maximize our resources, try and delegate uh, uh, work to people and see how we can get the best stories out. But despite all this, independent journalists are usually arrested for doing their jobs. Journalists like Asif Sultan have been in prison for almost three years for covering stories that weren't approved by the Indian government or the police. And he's not the only one. Several young photojournalists have also been arrested for, you know, being fucking journalists. <laughs> Taking photos. Yeah. Look, governments controlling journalism is like a professor grading on a curve where only they get an A and all of the students <laughs> get an F+. Plus. <laughs> Kashmiri journalists are being treated the same way that the U.S. has treated Julian Assange. They're being criminalized for telling the truth. So to America, India is nailing freedom of the press. There you go. By getting rid of the press, right? It, it's, it's, good to, <laughs> it's good to have mentors. You know, you need somebody to look up to, it's, which, is, which is nice for India, I guess. But the stories of Kashmir are getting out there, but it's not easy. Ifat Gadia, the host of the Kashmir podcast, reflects on how she was actually able to talk to people in the valley. Many of you have raised the concern that the guest voice was not so clear in our first episode. The reason for that is either that they did not have internet at all, or maybe because they only had a 2G connection. This is an internet connection that's so weak that it's almost non-existent in the rest of the world. Unfortunately, our first guest did not have access to the internet and as a result, the interview was delayed for weeks. Eventually, we decided to send them the questions and they sent us answers in audio files, which we eventually stitched together and brought you the first episode. Most of our guests that we interview live in Kashmir and most of them do not have access to internet. It has been more than a year now that 4G internet is yet to be properly restored across Kashmir. If it's got a Twitter, her, her Twitter was recently suspended without warning for publishing her podcasts. But thanks to activists, Twitter restored her account so she can share her story with a global audience. 
But guys, don't worry. Okay, it's not just Kashmiri journalists that India is censoring via Twitter. Anyone that's talking about India's current COVID crisis being a consequence of trading public health for the sake of capitalism is also a target. And mm-hmm. anybody talking about the farmer strikes against neoliberalism is mm-hmm. also a target. Look, India believes in censorship for all, okay? Mm. They're, just, they're just super progressive authoritarians, you guys. <laughs> very lefty authoritarians. But th- yeah. <laughs> but thanks to the fascist Pandora's box, the international com- community commends India for being a champion of democracy. But there is no democracy in a world that Im- that imprisons journalists, cuts access to information and communication, and robs kids of their childhood via military occupation. Look, democracies don't use 1984 as a fucking instruction manual. All right. <laughs> It's just not what they do. History isn't written by the winners, but rather assholes who claim victory. But Mm -hmm. if we amplify the truth in mass and make the international community face the truth, then we might be able to close this Pandora's box. Mm 